Good afternoon. I'm Deacon Ron from the Catholic Church of the Redeemer in Mechanicsville. And on behalf of Mike's family, closest friends, I want to thank you and welcome you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I hope you realize how significant and helpful and important it is to Mike's family and close friends to have your loving presence here today. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In this moment of sorrow, the Lord is in our midst and consoles us with his word. Blessed are the sorrowful, for they shall be comforted. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus addressed the crowds. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided his property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the f swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered the servants, Quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then... Let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. This is a very powerful parable from Jesus who taught constantly in parables. 
It is one of the most powerful for us as we live our lives because it's a lesson in mercy and forgiveness and something that is often difficult for us as human beings. This lesson reminds us there are several pieces of forgiveness. There are three critical milestones on the path of forgiveness. The first is to seek forgiveness, which is a very critical milestone. Nothing really happens until we seek forgiveness. It was that moment when the son in the parable woke up and thought, I can go back to my father. I don't deserve anything, but I can go back to my father. And for many of us, that moment in life when we realize the path we are on has to change is the most critical moment. The second part is to be forgiven. It's the part over which at that point we have very little control. But being forgiven is the main lesson of this story because our father forgives like a father, a father who never loses love for the father's children. Sometimes we get in that place where we think we don't deserve it. That's not our call, our first step to seek forgiveness. But then the most important step is to feel forgiven. Because unless we feel forgiven in our heart, we still carry the weight of the life that preceded that moment when we sought forgiveness. So let us not be like that other brother who withholds forgiveness in a way that sounds like many of us as children. It's not fair. Well, life is not fair, but forgiveness and mercy is very real. And let Mike's life and this parable be a lesson for us to know when to seek forgiveness, to forgive others as we are forgiven, but mostly to feel forgiven. We have several people who would like to speak today. And I'm going to call Chris. And sense the love that's in front of you. Thank you, Ron. Whew. Hi, my name is Chris. Hi, Chris. I, I'm the proud brother of an alcoholic. In April of 1996, my brother found himself standing on the front doorstep of our parents' house. He was the prodigal son in every way. His house was in financial ruin. He was essentially homeless, and he was estranged from his wife and his kids. They say that you can never go back and make a new start, but you, you can always start right now and make a new ending. And that is exactly what he did. That is a beginning, but I would like to first back up to the beginning. I have no memory of a life without Mike. And at times he has been my guardian and protector. He has been a trusted advisor and teacher. And by that I mean the birds and the bees. Uh, he was a role model at times. And at other times, he was a cautionary tale. He was not just my brother, he was my friend. Mike was born on the 25th of February in 1956 in a little town called Clovis, New Mexico, where our dad was stationed as a fighter pilot. They moved back to Richmond in 1957, and I came along in 1962. I'm six years younger than Mike, and I think that's why we didn't have a lot of sibling rivalry. And we always got along pretty well. We were raised in a house full of love. 
Our mom and dad were free to show emotion to each other and to us and to encourage us to do the same. And some of you will be tired of hearing me say it, but for those of you who have never heard me say it before, I will tell you this, that in all my life and in all of Mike's life, never once did we hear our parents raise their voice at one another in anger. They did not always agree, but we didn't settle things by screaming. Our grandparents lived on a big farm called Brook Hill, just north of Richmond. And although I was too young, my grandfather would come down whenever he would find a, a new nest of rabbits or a possum with babies on its back and would grab Mike and take him up just to show him so he could see. We grew up in a neighborhood called Meadowood, a nice place to live, according to the sign, and it was. We rode bikes, we played in the woods, we dammed up the creek, and all the things that kids did in the 60s and 70s before there was screen time. We went to St. Paul's parochial school, K through eight. Looking back on it, you would have thought that we grew up in a 1950s TV show. We weren't really wealthy, but as I look back on it, I think we were pretty rich in some ways. Sometime around 1969, I would have been about seven, and Mike would have been about 13. And this was in a time before somebody figured out that it might be not a great idea to package a box of caustic chemicals with a recipe book on how to build explosives and sell it to children as a chemistry set. Well, Mike had one. And we were downstairs in our, at the time, unfinished basement with a cement floor. And Mike had the chemistry set going. I don't know what he was doing, but the little alcohol lamp was burning. And I had this little footstool. It was round and about this tall. And I turned it over on its side, and I was laying over it on my belly and just kind of rolling back and forth. And somehow I managed to tip it over. And I fell into the experiment that Mike was working on. And I crashed into that lamp, knocked it over, and it shattered. And the alcohol spilled up my arm, and then immediately it ignited. Now, I did what any smart seven-year-old kid would do when he looked down and he was on fire. I went screaming bloody murder towards the stairs where mom and dad were. To this day, I have no idea how Mike was able to clear the broken glass and catch me 10 steps away. But he was able to take his bare hands and rub out the flames. Now, I had on a sweatshirt, and it took the brunt of the fire. And my arm and Mike's hand was left with basically a little sunburn. But he was my protector. In 1974, I would have been 12, and Mike would have been 18. And my friend Andy and I had pedaled our bikes up to the 7-Eleven at the top of the hill from where we live, going to get a Slurpee or something. And there were two other kids that were there at the same time. One was a couple years older than we were, and one was uh, obviously a few years younger. Now, if you, like Mike and I, are fans and aficionados of the movie A Christmas Story, <laughs> you will know exactly what I mean when I tell you that these two kids were Scut Farkas and his little toady, Grover Dill. Well, Scut Farkas came out of the 7-Eleven ahead of us, and we followed a minute later, followed close behind by the toady, who found it necessary to make some smart aleck comment to my friend who responded in kind. Well, the toady started screaming and yelling, and the next thing you know, Scott Farkas comes pedaling back with blood at his eyes. And he started to say something to my friend Andy, and then he turned around at me, and he got out about two words, and he stopped, and he said, are you Mike Bevan's brother? And I said, yes. And he said, man, I party with that dude. <laughs> and from that moment on, you would have thought that I was the brother of Don Corleone. <laughs> when he left, his parting words were, you make sure you tell Mike that Scott Farkas said hello. As I got older, I used to stay up late 
and I would wait for Mike and his friends to come home. They lived a fast life. And I was like a kid at the seaside waiting for the pirates to come back and listen to the tales of the adventures. They were exciting and they were funny and there was sometimes an element of danger. Now, at that time, Mike could run with a pretty hard and fast crowd, but Mike was not hard and fast. Mike was always the person that all of you know. He might have broken the law, but he didn't ever set out to hurt anyone or to steal from anyone. He was just out to have a good time. As I said, Mike was also a cautionary tale. I watched as he made two tries at his senior year of high school before he gave up and he dropped out. I have a clear memory of my dad and my brother standing nose to nose on our back steps as I stood in the far back portion of our backyard and they were screaming at each other. If you know my dad, that was not him. And I can remember being terrified that they were gonna come to blows and that they might hurt one another. And I can remember mom crying when he would storm out of the house, upset about some perceived injustice. Eventually, Mike moved out of the house and he got married and he started a family. And he did pretty well for a high school dropout. He'd get up and he'd go to work early. He'd be there all day. He'd probably smoke a bowl at lunch. Then he'd work the afternoon and he'd come home and he'd drink a 12-pack. He did that day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. In spite of that, to my knowledge, Mike was never late for work. That was him. And so he just held it together until he couldn't hold it together anymore. And so we returned to the prodigal son on my parents' front steps. Now, if you know my mom and dad, it will come as no surprise that they welcome Mike back home without hesitation or reservation. There were two caveats. Number one, if you drink or you do drugs, you are out. And number two, you will get help. And so that is how I came to have the privilege of taking Mike to his first AA meeting. Now, Mike and I remember the specific details of this story a little differently, but it's essentially the same story. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, in the program, there is a chip system, like a poker chip. So when you go, your first chip, when you first go in, there's a white chip. And as I understand it, it sort of signifies surrender and your commitment to the program and your path to sobriety. And there's a three-month chip and a year chip and five-year chips, on and on and on. Well, in the explanation of this process, somehow Mike got a little confused. And instead of understanding that this was a mark or a milestone of something that you had achieved, he understood that it was more of an aspirational thing. And so when they came to Mike and they said, uh, would you like a chip? He said, yeah, I want the 25-year chip. <laughs> People laughed, but they were kind, and they explained it, how it really worked. And that night, Mike took home his white chip. But I should say that this past April, Mike got that 25-year chip. With sobriety, Mike found himself he sat down with our dad, the bank examiner, and he set up a plan to put his financial house back in order. And it took him years, but he did it. He regained the respect of his children and his brother. You know, <clears throat> I hear the story of the prodigal son, and I'm reminded that not only was Mike the prodigal son, but I was the brother. <laughs> I have to, I'd be lying if I didn't say there was some part in me that said, wait a minute, I didn't run off and break the law and drop out of school, what about me? And I told the story when Mike and Cindy got married that 
I was a little ashamed to admit at the time if you'd have asked me if Mike was going to be successful in his path to sobriety, I don't know if I could have bet on it. And I'm proud to say he proved me so wrong. His marriage to his first wife, Darlene, was over, but they managed to co-parent together and they raised four great kids. And with the passage of time, they were able to rebuild their friendship, which continued until this day. It might surprise some of you to hear that it would not be unheard of for Mike and Cindy and all the kids to be gathered at Darlene's on Christmas or Thanksgiving so that all the family could be together. With sobriety, Mike pursued his education with a vengeance. And almost immediately upon getting sober, he went back and he got his GED. And after his GED, a few years after that, he got his associates and then his bachelor's degree in psychology, 4.0 GPA. Mike wanted to use his education and his personal experience to help other people, and man, did he. He has helped countless people achieve and maintain their sobriety both in the program and outside of it. He spent years mentoring at-risk youth in the community and in the school system. His story gave him credibility and he was not afraid to share it unflinchingly and without sugarcoating it for anyone he thought could benefit from it. With his sobriety, Mike created not only a new ending for himself, but for many, many other people. Mike wasn't a particularly religious person, but to me, he did epitomize the ideals of a Christian life. Mike loved deeply, he forgave easily, and he gave freely of himself to others. Mike had a strong moral compass, and he had a, sorry mom, a very refined bullshit detector. <laughs> he would not let something slide if you were trying to put one over on it. But even so, he just wanted to help people. Mike was a great cook. Some of you I know have had his chili. It was great. Some of you are recognized from the many fight nights that we had at Mike's house to watch the UFC. And a great time was had by all. Mike was artistically talented. He was a self-taught guitar player, but he was also just, he could have been a good artist. I spent a lot of years in my career as a graphic designer, and I pursued that path based on accolades I received as a child and a young man. But I'm here to tell you that when I got praised for that as a young person, all I was doing was copying what I had seen him do. And if he had pursued that path, he'd have been much better than I ever was. Mike had blue eyes that could put Frank Sinatra to shame. Every day at 7 p.m. for years and years, Mike would call our mom. And the conversation always began the same way. Hello, mother. <laughs> and every call he shared with me always ended the same. Love you. Bye. The weekend before Mike passed away, he and I spent most of that Saturday and Sunday painting the new wood at our screen porch at the River House, which looks really good, by the way. And late that Saturday afternoon, we were standing there. He was working at one side of the porch, and I was working at the other. And suddenly, this voice from the past came hollering across the porch. I must have heard this a 100 times. Look at that snake. And out he goes, charging out of the screen porch to this six-foot black snake that's crawling across the yard being pursued by a mockingbird. And doing his best Steve Irwin, Mike dove for the snake to grab him by the tail before he got through the fence. Well, the snake got away. But as Mike stood up and brushed himself off, I remember thinking at the time, 
This man is 65 years old, and he's still diving on the ground looking for snakes. That Sunday, when we were packing up and cleaning up, Mike just sort of made an off-the-cuff comment. He stood there as we were packing, and he said, Imagine that. Two brothers working all weekend on a painting project, and nobody's ever yelling at each other. Imagine that. I will be forever grateful for that weekend. I had no idea how priceless that time was. I am so proud of you, brother. I love you. Bye. Thank you, Chris. The number of people here today is a testament to how many people Mike had an impact on. And likewise, how many people had an impact on him. We've asked five of those people uh, to say a few words today, and I'd like Schreeder to come up first. Thank you. Yeah, just a, here we go, a little bit better. Um, hi, my name is Schreeder. And I'm not done yet, wait. And I am a grateful recovering alcoholic and a grateful friend of Mike Bevan. Now your turn. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate you asking us to do that, Chris. Um, it brings to light a lot of things that make me who I am and what helped me endear myself and Mike endear himself to me. I wrote pages and typed them out and made them big letters so I could see because these eyeballs are bad. Um, when I think of Mike, I think of love. Endless, boundless, giving love. He has touched everyone who made it here, even more who are not here today. I'm grateful for the time I've had with him. My life has been richer since the last 15 years since meeting Mike. We first met on a Thursday night <laughs> around a large kitchen table. He reached out his hand and he welcomed me. I didn't realize that this, he was not only welcoming me to that Thursday group, but also to his life. I think that's what he did to a lot of folks. We shared our struggles, our achievements, and God forbid, our feelings <laughs> around that table. He showed me that even though I was an ink-stained wretch, I was a good man, a good husband, a good father, and a good person. We got to know each other very well over those uh, many Thursday nights, many, many moons ago to start. He invited our family over to Cindy in, in his new house, uh, way out there, uh, old Washington Cedarly. It felt like I needed a lunchbox and a cooler to take the drive. I, I didn't know Richmond very well. But years later, a few years later, we ended up moving not far from him. It wasn't coincidence, I don't believe. I was told many, many moons ago that there's no coincidences in life. And I believe in my higher power of God, if you will, that brought me to Mike. We spent many an afternoon, evening, barbecue, Halloween, Christmas time, all those beautiful trees at that house. With his help, uh, we actually had some Super Bowl parties at our house, but I needed his help because I'm not as good of a cook as he was. And uh, I would be glad and relatively safe to serve food to people who came over that weekend. Um, 
remember going over his house just at a lark, and we'd sit there, and my wife, Karthika, would go, God, where, how long is he going for? But Mike and I would be having these heated arguments over politics. <laughs> Oof. Weather. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> and football. But after each time we left and parted, we still hugged and told each other we loved each other. I learned much from Mike. I learned that friendship and brotherhood in this journey we call life or whatever it is means a lot. I learned that family time is important time, that being present with a capital P is even more important. I learned that there's peace being out in the water. And I also learned that I'm not a fisherman. I don't have the patience or the chops for that stuff. I just don't do it. Mike shared his passions and his family with me and our family. We got to know all the Bevan brood, <laughs> the brood, Cindy, Sarah, Adam, Paul. I know I remember your name, Paul. Aaron and their, and Kelly and Vicky and everybody else. I, I forget the cousins' names. I'm so bad with names, so I'm sorry. Um, his father was a beautiful man. I got to sit with him during at the house when you had these little parties, and I just sit. I don't know. I don't even remember what we talked about, but it was just sitting and chatting about something. But I felt comfortable there. And Bimal, gosh, a great inspiration in his life. And, and, and I mentioned to you before we when I got here that I, I call my mom more than I used to, which is weird. <laughs> Growing up back in the 80s, 90s, it would be like, you know, $2 a minute to call home, and I was always away from home, and, or a dollar a minute, and I'd talk to him once a week because we couldn't afford long-distance bills. Now it's free, and I don't call her as much. But just so happens I'm calling her a little bit more often now. I think it was my kind of inspiration. He shared his love of NASCAR. He had no choice <laughs> to be at his house and hear NASCAR roll, and it was beautiful. And the speakers are fantastic. <laughs> he would show you them, too. Uh, and the Packers. Um, I didn't like much when he was preening about our house after the Super Bowl 45 when the Packers beat my Steelers. I was not very happy with that. <laughs> but he did serve some good burgers and dogs, so I was very grateful for that. And I didn't know there could be so many camera angles in these races. I just did not understand that. It's just one huge, wide left turn <laughs> over and over for three long hours. <laughs> but I sat with him and watched the race anyway. And Karthika and my girl still didn't understand why I'd be sitting there for so long watching a race that I had no care for. I didn't even care if they crashed or not crashed. Usually people watch for the crashes, right? I didn't care. I was reviewing some of my texts that we've had over the years, and he and I got to go to one of the races one time, and it was fantastic. We were on the infield, and, and it was lively, and his eyes were lit up, and shared, he shared so much of that beauty. I understood where he came from about NASCAR. Still don't get the Packers, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> he shared his love of trucks, that beautiful blue F-150 and impressed upon me that I, too, must have one. <laughs> so much that I finally, after many years, got my wife to say I could get one. Yay. Actually, that's a big yay. I'm so excited. Most of all, and most important to me, he shared his fears and sorrows, his hopes and dreams. He shared that being vulnerable is truly strength. I was told a long time ago that it's important to have intimacy with another man, not in the way you think. It's, um, it's not me prancing around in a blue negligee or anything. It's not that. Just, just stop. Please don't, don't get that out of your head. Um, I was told when I'm able to share my thoughts and feelings 
and hopes and desires of life with another man. I'm intimate with them. That, that I allow him to really see me. The phrase, into me you see, is a true form of intimacy. Mike allowed me to see him truly and with heart. Among the many things I'm grateful for, this was the greatest gift I received from him. I will miss Mike, Michael, Ignatius, Beauregard, Dave, David, Bev. I forgot his middle name, so I just added them. <laughs> I will miss him. I will miss his infectious smile. I will miss his wry grin. I will miss his character-shaping hat. I will miss his oddly sexy style of dress. <laughs> I will miss him asking me to come over when I had time. I will miss him reminding me that life was good and that God was good. Mike gave of himself, of his time, and of his heart. That is why when I think of Mike, I think of love. I'll miss you, Mike. Thank you, Schreeder. Scott, would you please come forward? My name is Scott, and I'm an alcoholic. Scott. I first met Mike at an oceanfront conference about 18 years ago in, down in Virginia Beach. Some of you may remember those. Um, he was wearing a cowboy hat and a vest, and uh, I remember going, wow, what a strange dude. <laughs> you know, and, and I was meeting a lot of strange people at that time. And... Um, you know, we, we bumped into each other for a while because we, we ran in the same circles. Uh, but it, it really wasn't until I started going on Thursday nights that I, I started to get to know Mike really well. And as near as I can remember, that was about 14 years ago. And since then, um, he, he's been in my life, you know. And even then, he seemed okay to me, but... I was still keeping people at arm's length at that time, and um, he started doing what Mike did. Every now and then he'd call me, or he'd send me this random text, leave me these goofy voicemails. You know, and eventually I'd call him back, and um, I think he enjoyed the challenge of trying to draw somebody out. And um, later he told me, he said, uh, he said I was fishing. He said I'd throw out my Scott bait, and um, when you would respond, I'd put that in my Scott tackle box, you know, and, and so I knew how to get you. And, and I know for a fact there are some people in this room that Mike had a tackle box with your name on it. It wasn't just me, because that was Mike. Um, one of the things that really struck me with Mike is when he would share would be the sincerity and the depth. Um, it became obvious to me very quickly that uh, he and I had walked similar paths. <clears throat> it also became apparent that he'd been a lot of, down a lot of paths that I hadn't been yet and that I could learn from him. So in 2007, 2008, I asked him to be my sponsor. And since that day, we either talked or had a text or some kind of communication. I talked to him that Thursday. The last thing I told him was I loved him. The last thing he told me was he loved me. I learned how to do that from Mike. You know, I came up on Mike... <laughs> It's funny because, 
you know, I when I first met Mike and first got to know him and, and everything, you know, he like I said, strange dude, right? But I, I started to realize that perhaps we had more in common than I really cared to admit, you know? He was a bit of a redneck. Check. He liked cars, fast cars, trucks, right? Um, driving fast, Game of Thrones, UFC, chicken sandwiches, and, you know, goodies grilled outside. And uh, he was really good at that. I, I came up um, one day on, on the river, Pianca Tank. He's, he's out there on the pier, and, and I'm coming down the stairs, and he's sitting in his chair, and he's, he's got a fishing rod in his hand, and I kind of look around, and his hat's tipped down. He's got his eyes closed. I thought he was asleep. And he looks up at me, he grinned, he gave me a little grin. He says, it's wonderful out here. And I said, yeah, it is. And I sat down beside him. And we sat there for a few minutes, and I looked over, and I said, when's the last time you checked the hook? He goes, oh, I didn't, I didn't bait it when I threw it out there. <laughs> he said, I, I really just wanted to sit here and enjoy the river. I don't feel like doing that much work if I catch something. <laughs> I understood that, oddly enough. And... Uh, he loved being out there, um, and he shared that with me. He shared it with a lot of people. And you know, over the years, Mike was an acquaintance. He became a friend. He became my sponsor. <laughs> he became my best friend. He became my brother. And um, he was someone that I could count on without question. And I know a lot of people knew him like that. Um, when I was in the hospital, I was in the hospital doing cancer treatments, and um, I was very sick. And the nurses had to wear gowns and masks and everything if they came in. And I couldn't see anybody else. And um, I was in there for over a month. And every day, even though he knew he couldn't get in to see me, he would come up to that hospital. And every day, one of those nurses would come in and put their hand on me and say, Mike's here. He wants you to know that. That was Mike. That was Mike. Mike was the first one I called when I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Mike was the first one I called when I tragically lost someone close to me. Mike was the first one I called when I dropped Devin off at college for the first time. Mike was the first one I called the day I met Leslie. Mike was fiercely loyal to those he cared about. You know, he, um, he taught me how to be a better friend, a better father, a better brother, a better son, a better spouse, a better person. He had his faults. He wasn't perfect by any means. But all his faults did was lend credibility to his truth. And he shared that with whoever he thought it would help. To Adam, Sarah, Paul, and Aaron, he was so proud of you all. He could barely contain himself when he would talk about you guys. And Chris, he respected you. He trusted you immensely. And he had no trouble convincing anybody that you deserved a Brother of the Year award either. So. He definitely fell for you. And Bimal, he respected you so much, and he would move heaven and earth to make sure he got that call in. That's all I saw him do it, more than once. And Cindy, Mike loved you more than he could say. He and I shared a lot over the years. And when he talked about you, I could see the love in his eyes. And I could hear it in his voice, even when he was grumpy about something. 
You know, I miss Mike. I know a lot of you, like me, we got this Mike, Mike-sized hole in our lives now. But I know this, I was blessed to know Mike, and I was blessed to share some of my journey with him, as we all were. And um, it's been a rough couple weeks, but I know this too, the pain we feel over his loss will never outweigh the love that we got from knowing him. And because of that, I'm not saying goodbye to Mike. I'm going to say farewell for now. Thank you, Scott. Steve Johnson will share some thoughts and memories of Mike. Steve. I've, uh, Steve Slick Johnson. Uh, you know his daughter Sarah met me, and my name was Slick to her, because that's what everybody called me. Uh, everybody in the program called me Steve Johnson. Uh, I was an alcoholic and still am, still sober. You know, me and Mike were one chip wonders. I met Mike at the first meeting Chris brought him to. He had thick glasses on. And I don't know whether he wanted to come in the room. I didn't know whether he was coming in the room for himself or for Chris. But, you know, I saw Chris pushing him, kind of. So, <laughs> so I figured out quick that Chris was pushing him in the door, you know. But, uh, you know, and I didn't realize that his daughter, Sarah, was dating my son until we got to talking. And she said, well, my dad... My, me and my wife were talking about going to meetings. She was wondering why we left the house four or five nights a week, and we were going to meetings. So finally my wife told her, well, we're going to meetings. And, you know, she said, well, my dad goes to some of these meetings, you know. And uh, she was talking and said, they're AA meetings. And my wife, Julie, said, well, that's where we go, you know. So we turned around the next Tuesday night over in Highland Springs at uh, – the Catholic Church, Mike pulled up in the parking lot, and I walked on. This is early in his sobriety, too, and uh, I was dark tanned, and uh, I walked toward the car, and Mike didn't know what was going on. And I said, I know you. <laughs> he said, well, I know you from these rooms. He said, I know you through your daughter. And uh, we'd always laugh. He talked to shared the story about a tan man approaching him in the parking lot and he didn't know <laughs> what was going to go on, you know. But, you know, that's the way Mike was. And, uh, you know, and that's, that to me, uh, you know, and I became Mike's sponsor. And uh, he asked me because they had children. I wanted to know how to get back close with them. You know, so I shared my life with him and told him what I did with my kids. You know, and I shared the love I had with my kids for Mike, and then he began to have the love for his children and his wife, Cindy. Uh, you know, he began to have a relationship with Darlene uh, through me sharing with the love with my wife, uh, Julie. You know, and through that, you know, we became close. He was just like a brother to me. You know, but at the Races and different things, you know, we'd go to the house for Christmas and this and that, and, you know, he invited us over for his chili, and he never put hamburger in his chili, he always had steak, you know. And that was Mike, but it, that steak was so soft and, you know, it just about melted in your mouth, and, you know, he was proud of that chili and that steak he put in there, you know. And he had the peppers on the side and this and that, and, you know, he said, I want to make my chili eatable for everybody. He said, I don't know whether everybody eats chili with peppers in it or not. So you want peppers, it's here on the side, you know. So, we, you know, that's the way he was. You know, he tried to make his food and his house and his French, uh, friendship comfortable, you know, for everybody. You know, it's love. But, you know, I remember the first time I really 
So Mike Smile, he was at the Richmond Dragway, sitting up in the stands, and it was on a Father's Day weekend. This was early in the sobriety, too. And he was sitting up there, and his daughter was down in the stages with us, I, I believe. And uh, she told me he was sitting up in the stands. So, you know, I waved him on down, and he kind of, you know, like me. And I said, yeah, you, you know, to myself. And he came on down, and my father had made a lap around, a couple laps around the track where it was, uh, you know, the petty day, uh, you know, with that. And, you know, so I took him. Asked Mike if he'd like to ride in one of those cars, you know. He looked at me, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you go on in and do the interview with the people inside, and I'll put you in the car. So, you know, that was uh, probably 24 years ago. And, you know, for that, you know, that's how I got real close to Mike and the racing and everything else. But, you know, I still stayed close with Mike and his daughter. His daughter dated my son for a while, and, you know, that's how we began to get closer and closer. You know, and that love was there for him and the whole family, you know. I met all his sons. I remember when Adam wrecked one of my cars. Oh, my truck, <laughs> you know. And my son was supposed to be driving the truck this day. Instead, he would maybe had one too many. <laughs> so he allowed Adam to drive my truck, you know. I remember Adam, it was a truck like a big Cadillac. It had back doors on it, an eight-foot bed, and Adam clipped one of these poles going through the McDonald's parking lot, you know, put a big dent in the side. So, you know, Michael, he was trying to tell me what Adam had done to my truck when he was supposed to be driving, <laughs> you know, and I said, how did that happen? He said, well, I couldn't get up, so I gave Adam the keys, you know. So... You know, and then I remember, you know, Adam bringing the money for the fee for the uh, deposit, you know, or the, de I forget what it is, you know, the amount of your money you have to pay for your truck, you know, out of your pocket, you know. And, uh, you know, and it was $800 then, you know, for the deposit. And, you know, I remember I handed that money back to Adam and telling him, it's already been paid. You take that money home, take care of your family. And I thought Adam was going to fall out of my front porch, you know. But I don't think he ever had anybody or knew of anybody that was going to hand him back free money, you know. But, you know, he just kind of looked at me and he said, do what? I said, man, your family needs it more than I do. So, you know, there are things along the way and. You know, I remember him fishing on the Chesapeake Bay with me, catching flounder. We had a big picture of a four or five pound flounder and, uh, in our hands, and one of my neighbors down in the Chesapeake Bay took that. You know, and different things like that. And, you know, it's, it's funny through life as you hear people come up here and talk about Mike. And like I said, Mike was a brother to me, and like I said, I thought Chris was the older brother. And Mike was a younger brother, you know, because he talked about Chris all the time. Chris this, Chris that, you know. When I'd go to a place on the water, Chris was making the decisions, you know. And Mike was saying, well, we're going to do this down there. You know, Chris says we need a new well. Chris said we need a new roof on that place at the river, you know. And I was able to get Chris in touch with the people that put the roof on. We were going to put the roof on ourselves, and Chris made a decision didn't a whole lot of the family know anything about roofing. <laughs> so, you know, he asked me if I knew a roofer. I said, you know, I can get a crew down there, Chris. They can do it pretty quick. He said, well, if we're going to do it, it'll take us a month. And I said, well, these guys can do it in a day or maybe a day and a half at the most. He said, bring them on down, <laughs> you know, give them a price. And I was I got them a price, and uh, they went in there and put it on in a day. You know, like I said, well, it'll take us a month now and there. And especially Chris was talking about it. He said, well, what do I need to do? I said, well, tell us, y'all, you all, you can probably just hand the shingles up instead of carrying them up a ladder, you know, just joking. But, you know, they had a low pole on the back of the house. Now. But, you know, they're the things 
uh, you know, they will remember about Mike and his family. Like I said, uh, he was like family to me, you know, and his family was family to me. And, uh, you know, I remember along the way, and <clears throat> I was sponsoring him, you know, and I sponsored him for that 25 years he was in the program. And, uh, you know, he finally along the way about probably 15 years in the program, I gave him weekends off. You know, because he called me every day for 25 years, you know, and he asked me, he said, why are you giving me weekends off? He said, can I still call you? <laughs> and, you know, and I said, if you want to, but you don't have to. He said, what's wrong? You know, <laughs> and I said, nothing's wrong. But I just figured I'd give you a free week weekend instead of having to call me and tell me what I was doing, you know, telling you what I was doing there. I said, well, that's why I'm giving the weekends off because I know you're doing pretty good, you know. <laughs> so, you know, with that, wasn't much after that, then Mike started sponsoring me, not because I took a drink, because I lost my older son, and Mike was my rock through that, you know. So, you know, that was the love uh, Mike had for me, and, uh, through the, my loss, and he met me at uh, the best pro shop with my wife. Uh, you know, the day before uh, we went to have the service for my son, you know, and he was a rock there, you know, and he showed his love. And that's what Mike was about, you know. I don't know how big his heart was, uh, but you can see from the people when my son passed, he was there and did a eulogy for my son, you know, and we had probably. I would say at uh, Nelson's funeral home, the parking lot was so full, they parked on the street, parked on the hotel next door and all that. And I met Mike in a little room off to the side, and he said, I don't know whether I can get up there and do this or not. He said, what do I need to do if I get stopped, you know, while I'm trying to do this eulogy? And Mike had read it to us before, and, uh, you know, before he got up there reading it in front of people a couple of days, he said, what do I need to change about it? And I said, nothing, you know. And uh, he had helped me write a letter to my one of my sons when we were going to do an uh, intervention on him, you know. And he helped me. He said, I don't want to change anything with what you're doing with that. And I said, well, Mike, that's why I'm not going to change anything you're doing with the eulogy for him, you know, for my older son. And that's not the one I was doing a uh, presentation to, you know, and sharing with my middle son what we were going to do, you know, but Mike was one that had a nick or a knack, whatever you want to call it, about putting words in the right places and this and that, and I didn't know how to write or really read very well, so Mike wrote what I told him, you know. Then we went back through it, and Mike said, well, I think his word here would bring it to the point more. He said, I don't want to change what you're saying, but I think this would hit the point a little better, you know. So I said, well, if you think that's better, you got the knowledge and the uh, learning capacity, so you put that word in there, you know. So then he read that back to me, you know, and that's, uh, that's what I read to my son. So, you know, there's different things me and Mike did in our life all the way through, you know. And, uh, you know, that was, that was it, and... I was hoping him and his, uh, Sarah would end up getting married, uh, but that didn't happen, you know. But Sarah is still a daughter to me and my wife, you know, and she always will be, you know. That's the thing about it, you know, is through the love we had for Mike, and then I ended up meeting his parents and all this and that, and his mom was telling him at one time, she told Mike, she said, well, if you can call that Don Sparty years, Every night, I think you need to start calling me every night, you know. <laughs> and, and after that, I think she called him every night, you know. And that's the way this program works, you know. You pass it on, you know. And like you shared, that Mike passed his love on to everybody he knew in the program, and he got me going to the wretches meeting, you know, the Einstein wretches, you know. And that helped me a whole lot. <laughs> Because that was right around the time when my son passed, and I really needed something. You know, in that meeting, once I stepped in the door, they saved my life. Uh, you know, because I was lost. And uh, they brought me back home to the surf. And that's the way Mike was. You know, he had a way of doing that. 
you know. And like I said, that's, that was Mike. You know, he will never be missed either. <laughs> Last time I saw him, he was sitting right over there in that corner. He had a hat on, that vest, and a nice shirt, and it was at my mom's service in Washington Moore Park. Uh, you know, he drove out there in that nice blue F 150. He loved, you know, he loved talking about that, and he loved talking about program. And I already had a couple of F 150s myself. You know, so even back when he came into the program, I'd dye my hair blonde and had a big earring in my ear. And he asked me, he said, Why'd you put that big earring in your ear? I said, just because I could, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, Mike went and got him a big earring, you know, <laughs> stuck in his ear. He said, well, if my sponsor can do it, I can do it. I said, yeah, I didn't get drunk over it, you know. So he said, what do I do if people say something about my earring? He, he, I said, you go tell them to talk to your sponsor about it, <laughs> you know. So that, you know, that's what Mike, uh, all through his life, and, you know, I could stand up here all day long and talk, but he gave me three minutes. I think I'll probably go on a little more than three minutes. <laughs> but like I said, I could I could stand up here and probably talk longer than Chris did. You know, but Chris put everything in it, in his paper and in, in the obituary in the paper that anybody could say, you know, as a brother, a friend, and as a loved one, you know. And that's how he was. You know, he loved Chris. Chris loved him. And, you know, we left that place down at the bay that day. And after this, I'll stop talking. But, you know, it was four of us down there. And we had a minister that showed up down there at the King Emperor Ground. And as everybody left, well, that morning when we got up, the guy, Byron, he was up making coffee and frying potatoes at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know. And Mike got up and said, what? H.O. are you doing? He said, well, I used to be a cook in the Army, and I'm cooking breakfast for y'all, you know. And we could smell the coffee and all that, but, you know, that was the friendship we had. But when we were leaving, one by one, we told each other we loved them. You know, and the minister was looking at us like Shreda said, you know, that tremendous love we had for each other. And, you know, the next one left, Byron. The next one left, Ben. Then the minister come up to me, he said, how can you tell another man you love him like that? And I said, well, Whitey, you have to share with the individual how you feel about them with the love you have for each other because you never know when you won't see them again. You know, so each time me and Mike talked on the phone, last thing we said, we loved each other. You know, that was it. But, you know, after that, Whitey, begin being able to share with people, men, that he loved them. And with my dad on the phone, uh, you know, that, that was it. You know, you pass on what was so freely given to you from God. You know, in my life, God is love. Mike was love. And that's what he presented out of himself uh, was love, you know. And uh, Mike, buddy, I still love you today. And you're not gone. <laughs> You always be in my heart. I can remember you always in that black hat and that black vest and strutting in there like the big rooster, you know, <laughs> when he came in, just poked out, you know, and just smiling. But, uh, buddy, you know, like I said, I'll always remember you. And thank you for uh, Chris for allowing me to be able to share a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Slick. Dickie and then Brian. Speaking in front of an audience is one of the most stressful people thing anybody can do. And all five of these guys beforehand said, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, my name is Dickie King. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, I'll yield my time to Steve. <laughs> Three minutes. Three so. I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning in a very small bed in a very small room in the communist state of Maryland. <laughs> I was at a retreat house there with a bunch of my friends, several who rode back with me, but a bunch of the ink-stained wretches were also there. 
And I, I woke up and it was four o'clock and I was in a total panic. I had, you know, written stuff down and, and, you know, had all my thoughts and I went back through my text messages from Mike and, and um, God, that guy was funny. Um, I mean, just in this really sarcastic kind of funny way. I was like, what am I going to say about this, man? And it was like, it was like all of a sudden this movie just ran through my mind really, really fast, really fast, really fast, really fast. I was sitting at the table at the Ingstain Wretches, at the dining room table, and Mike always sat to my left, always. We called each other wingman. And it was like all the times that the man sat beside me and we talked and we laughed and we joked. And he, 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 if you knew Mike at all, you knew he had this kind of a sideways grin. He would look at you with just a little sideways grin. He would come to the house, and he would come to the living room, and he would get there early, and he'd pull out, he'd pull out the piano bench, and he would set up his guitar, and he would just start playing. And I don't know if he ever even knew any songs, really. He'd just play his guitar, but it sounded great. I mean, it was fun to listen to. It was set a really good mood and mo a tone for the whole thing, and then when it was about time to... Uh, to start the meeting, Mike would pack his stuff up, and he'd come sit down next to me and uh, tell me what we were supposed to do next because he knew I don't remember much of anything. So he would say, we're on such and such a page and we're gonna read to here. So, okay, that's great. It was great to have somebody like that to help me. Um, I have a biological brother and I'm very close to my biological brother. And I was as close to Mike as I am to my biological brother. Uh, I'm going to read something real quick, just at least a part of it. Um, the way I met Mike was through Rick Sanders, a.k.a. Dude. Did I introduce myself? Okay, did I say I was an alcoholic? Okay. Did I say he gave me three minutes or less? Okay. All right, I'd love to read this, but it won't open up anymore. It's opened up a bunch of times. But here's the bottom line of it, I think. Um, Rick had gone to one of his first meetings, right? And he met Mike. And he, he, he started crying in the meeting. He got very upset. And uh, he kind of moved away, got away, and... And Mike went over to him, and he put his arm around him and said, I can't stand to see a man cry alone. And that's the kind of man he is. That's the kind of man he was. That's the kind of man I'm going to remember. I can't stand to see a man cry alone. And uh, he reached out so many times to so many men that came to the Thursday night meeting that would express, I don't get this, I don't understand this. And they'd get a phone, and they'd come and tell me later, this guy Mike called me up, and he was really helpful. And he told me things that I didn't understand. He helped me out with it, and, and I feel better now, and I know what to do. And that's just, but he didn't brag about it. He never bragged about anything, you know, not to me. Well, fishing. <laughs> I got a picture on my phone he sent me not too long ago, actually, of uh, um, what was the name of that kind of root beer he liked, began, uh, Ben Hammer, Ben Ben Hammer, root ginger ale, ginger ale. That um, what did I say, root beer. Anyway, ginger ale. You're right. So, um, I'm not a real good public speaker, by the way. I'm just just kind of. But um, he sent he sent me a picture of this, sitting on the post at the pier with a fishing fishing pole next to it, and the caption said, um, "At the river." called it drinking on the job. <laughs> in, uh, in April, Mike sent me a picture of you and him on your wedding day for your anniversary. And it was beautiful. Mike would... Uh, We would have, you know, we'd read books, right? We'd read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and then we'd read another book. And then we'd go back to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And Mike was a big studier. 
I mean, he knew stuff. He would study stuff. So if we were reading a different book, a different spiritual read, he'd have that open and the big book open. And uh, I could always tell when something was going to happen with Mike. He had these real skinny glasses. Glenn commented on his, he would watch Mike put on his glasses. And he'd pull them out. Mike was very definite about everything he did, every movement, every motion. He was very definite about it. He would get his case out, and it was a production. He pulled his glass out, and it was glasses out, and it was a production. He would put them on, and then he would do his read. Well, I knew something was about to happen because, and this was a regular thing with Mike, he would pull his glasses off when he was getting ready to talk, and he would put them down, and he would say, I don't really agree with what we're reading here. <laughs> and then he'd tell us why. And I didn't always agree with what Mike didn't agree with, but I didn't have to. It was That was Mike's thing, and it, and it was his share. Um, I, I found out, I got a text from Scott Sunday that Mike had passed, and I was walking into the Best Buy. And, uh, you know, went in to make a purchase, and this young 20-year-old fella Came walking up, can I help you? Yeah, sure. Sure, I need some help. Told him what I wanted, and he went back, and he got what I wanted, and he came back with it. And he took one look at me, and he said, are you okay? I said, not really. Hmm. I just lost a good friend. And this 21-year-old kid, with his britches down below his butt, <laughs> says... You need a hug. And he said, uh, after a, a wonderful hug, a loving hug, he said, this is a 21-year-old kid. He said, I lost my good friend to a drunk driver. My brother was shot and killed. And then my best friend was shot and killed. Here's what I learned. Don't stop talking about him. That's how you keep your friend alive. You talk about him. If you want to know how much Mike Bevins is loved, look around. I, I, look around. Take a second. Just look around. How many people are here? This is how many people the man touched in 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 his life. It's, and I think this is only a fraction. I know he touched my life. We were, you know, this was Memorial Day, of course, and. My daughter and her boyfriend were home visiting. And my daughter, the Inkstain Wretches, she grew up in the Inkstain Wretches, right? So she knows all of these guys. I, she's known Mike for 20 years. She was like 13 when he started coming around in my house. And uh, her boyfriend, she talks about the Inkstain Wretches, and she calls them her uncles. And uh, Marshall asked her while we were sitting there on the sofa, and he says, uh, was Mike one of your uncles? Oh, yeah. He helped my, raise my kid, too. He was, he was a part of what she is and what makes her who she is today. Um, Mike got me to do some work over at his parents' house. A while back, and uh, my parents had already died at that point. And so I asked him if he minded if I called his parents dad and mom. He said, absolutely not, because they were just like my dad and mom. And if you know Mike's dad and mom, you know what, how Mike got to be how Mike got to be. Mike loves family. He talked about you a lot. And it was all good, I say. And it was. It was all good. And he talked about his children and his parents. He was so proud of that picture of his dad in the jet. You know, and he just he loved it. Um, he invited me to his house. He invited everybody to his house. The thing about Mike Bevan, if you met him and were willing to get to know him, as far as he was concerned, you were part of the family. And he told that to me many times. You are absolutely part of my family. Mike really didn't have a belief in God. Mike just knew that God was. 
And he made that decision a long time ago. I know that God is. There was just no question, so it didn't come to being a belief. Um, I don't know if my three minutes are up, and I can talk like like Steve. I can talk on and on, but um, the the preacher here told us that you know they're gonna start getting bored. So y'all y'all need to move it on. And, um, I, I uh, last thing I said to Mike, he was leaving Thursday before last, and he was walking up the hill, up the driveway. And he hadn't said goodbye. I was talking to somebody else. He didn't say goodbye to a lot of other guys, but I was talking to somebody. And so I just, uh, I, I hollered up at him, uh, you know, hey, Mike, I love you, brother. I'll, I'll see you later. And he turned around and gave me that crooked smile, and he said, I love you too. I'll see you soon. I'm a little scared now, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. I actually thought about wearing a hat and a vest and a bolo because I have all three, but then I thought, you know, I just can't pull that off, man. That, that's, a, that's a Mike Bevan original. I'm really glad you all are here. I'm really glad I'm here. So have a great night. Thank you, Mike, Thank you. and I love you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Brian? Hi, uh, my name's Brian. I'm an alcoholic. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to take long. I can keep track of time. Uh, so, <laughs> a little shot there, right? But I'm going to take a little liberty because it took a little longer. I'm going to add in one little story that's funny. Uh, and in the end, I'm going to ask you all to help me with something. Um, so, when Mike came into the program, uh, like all of us, he was uh, a little confused, a little lost, and uh, a little broken. And um, it was a long time ago, so I don't have the facts straight, right? But uh, the gist of it, I do remember. Um, and we went to a flea market, and you got to kind of watch newcomers because you can't tell what they're going to do, right? So you, you know, keeping them kind of close by. And Mike came back with this fishing rod. I mean, fishing reel that he had bought. I think it was a Shimano or something, and he knew something about it. And um, he said, I got this, and I don't remember the prices, but I think he said, I got it for $100, and he's really pleased, you know? And I'm like, that's awesome, but the price tag's 60 right? Right on the front. And I'm thinking, <laughs> let's go back, you know, find where this came from, get your money back. And he said, no. The, in, in the meeting before that, I left that out, we've been talking about cash register honesty and honesty and stuff like that. And anyway, he said, um, he said, no, the fishing reel is worth $200. So used, it's worth at least 100 And he said, so if I gave her 60 for it, I would be stealing. And I thought, well, my first thought was, oh, crap, you know. Because <laughs> my idea of cash register honesty didn't go that far, right? <laughs> A little irritating. But, um, you know, walking out, and, um, you know, we went by the table where, where he had bought the fishing rod, and I saw the couple that was there, and, and he was right. He was absolutely right. That money needed to stay at the table, you know. Right from the beginning, he was getting the program on a different level. Uh, he, was, uh, he was catching up very quickly. And more recently, Mike was one of the people that, you know, you saw come up and change and grow and, and risk love again, you know. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing to happen. Well, they become our support system, right? And he was one of the people that you have when you're totally lost it, you got somewhere to go, right? I knew I could show up at his front door unannounced any time, and that door would be open for me. And I knew my front door was always open to him. And I'm getting lost anyway. Um, Anyway, I'll just cut to the board's end. I was, I was you know, how, how do you do this? How do you, how do, how do you get in front of people and, and, and have a celebration of life when, when, you, when you're breaking inside, right? And, uh, and I thought, you know, he's somebody I would call in this much pain and say, you know, what do I do? What, what would I say? And I, I, think he would, I think he would say, you know, some of the normal stuff you hear, you know, you pick up the phone, 
you know, talk to some friends, you know, get to some meetings. Let people know, don't isolate, don't back up. If you have to, stand in front of a room of half strangers and say, I'm suffering, I'm hurting. And be transparent, let people in. And, um, and I'm thankful for that. And like has been referenced a couple of times, you know, this is what Mike built, right? This, this, this pain that I feel right now is because of love. And it's, and it's love that he built in his life. So it, I don't know that Mike would want us really looking at his life today. I think he'd want us looking just outside of it for the people he impacted, the people he connected with, the people he helped. And, and, and I think one thing I loved about Mike was he was always so obvious, you know, very, very straightforward about things. And, 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 and I'm thinking that as well. And I look around the room and I don't know all your faces. Some of you are strangers to me. We're connected through Mike. Mike's not here to do that anymore. So now it's our job. The love that he put together in this room of semi-strangers, now it's on us to connect for that love to stay and what Mike built continues to live. And so I'm gonna invite you to look around the room, look for somebody who's not sitting in a group or whatever. And before you leave, make sure that they know you care, connect. The biggest thing I'll always remember about Mike is every time he saw me, he had this kind of motion thing. It looked like he was drawing two guns, like a six shooter. It's like, I can't get out of here. But it's like he cocked back, like he's going for two guns. You know? <laughs> I'm like, whoa, what is that? And then go sideways, and then that smile. And he looked like he was delighted to see you. And he looked like he was delighted to see me. Because he was. And I want to learn from that. You know, men, men don't know how to behave. We're trying to be tougher. So I don't know. And, you know, if you're excited to see someone, make sure they know it. And I'm excited to see you. I'm excited to see the love. And it's been an honor to walk with Mike. And I'll see him when I get home. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, all six of you, for sharing your love with us. We remember that with God, there is mercy and fullness of redemption. And Chuck will come back now and, and play the Lord's Prayer. And I ask during that time, you think of the message and of the love.
Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, you are always faithful and quick to show mercy. Our brother Mike was too quickly taken from us. Come swiftly to his aid, have mercy on him, and comfort his family and friends by the power and protection of the cross. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, surround the family of Mike with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Blessed are those who have died in the Lord. Let them rest from their labors, for their good deeds go with them. Eternal rest granted to him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. And may the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep in your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may Almighty God bless each of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We conclude, but we do not. I ask you to follow the advice, and you're welcome to stay for as long as you want and share your love and share your openness with each other and be present for each other in this time of need. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>